Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us for this week's economic update. I'm Dan Kuntz, Director of Professional Development at the MOST CPA, and I would like to welcome you to today's program. Well, another difficult week has passed, and I hope everyone is staying safe. Though the experts predict that the virus may be nearing its peak, we know we still have a long way to go. All we can do is keep pushing through and continue to lean on each other for support and guidance. We are continuing to provide you with the resources that might hopefully help you get through these times a little bit easier. Please take a minute to look at the resource page on our website where we have news and additional learning opportunities, including another update from Chris taking place next week, Friday, April 24th at noon. I encourage all of you to read the emails that we continue to send to members every Friday. And please don't hesitate to reach out to our staff for anything that you may need during this time. Now, one of our trusted business partners and advisors over the years has been Chris Keel. Since the pandemic hit, we have been in talks with Chris to see how we could best inform our members. From that conversation, this series was developed. I encourage all of you to read the Daily Business Intelligence Brief and Chris's article in our upcoming May Asset Magazine. We truly appreciate his partnership, and I know what we will learn from him over these sessions will help us in guiding our businesses. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Chris Keel. Thanks. All right, thank you very much. And we will get into round two or three or wherever we are <laughs> with this conversation. I am so looking forward to the day that I can begin my day not talking about the viral plague. I'm also looking forward to the point where I can actually see you in person rather than being limited to my to my lovely visage on a, on a zoom camera um I, I do have to point out that yesterday my cat made his her debut on webcam she kind of leaped in front of the thing right in the middle of this so you, you are at least spared that so we've been talking about this as a black swan event from the very beginning um so now maybe we're looking at the departure of the black swan or at least we think we might be looking at the departure of the black swan the conversation has shifted a little bit from what we do to deal with COVID-19 to how we deal with the economic disaster that was created to deal with COVID-19 we are in a as mentioned before a dual crisis situation we have the viral infection itself and then we have the reaction to the viral infection the lockdown recession so we'll talk a little bit about how those are playing out as we go. So the economic impact has been pretty obvious. Um, businesses cease to operate. There has been massive job loss and unemployment. The numbers now, I think, are around 22 million uh, people who have been rendered jobless. There have been pay cuts. There has been an increased amount of business debt. Um, GDP growth has fallen. Investment's been crippled. The stock market has plunged. It's just been a delightful period of time. Um, the last few weeks have been anything but relaxing. A lot of these are unusual in terms of their origin and probably will be just as unusual in terms of their departure. Um, you look at things like the job losses, and we'll talk about this off and on uh, for the next hour. The challenge with this kind of unemployment is that it is not structural. Um, it is reactive. And we're dealing with what amounts to a national furlough, and, and we're still kind of grappling with how that's going to play out and, and what the, the circumstances will be. This is not unfamiliar, in a sense, to certain industries. I mean, if you look at the automotive sector, they go through this every summer where you shut down auto plants for a period of time so that they can reboot and rework and put in new machine tools. During that period of time, the workers are laid off, technically. I mean, they're drawing unemployment. They are no longer exclusively being paid by the company. But they're not really fired. They're coming back. At some point, the retooling is completed, and these workers come back to work. So they're not technically really unemployed, they're furloughed. What we have in the US right now <clears throat> are a lot of companies who have turned to their workers and said, well, <clears throat> we have no choice but to let you go right now because we don't have any income and we can't pay you. 
However, when this all changes, we're going to bring you back. And therefore, you're not really fired. You're not really laid off. As soon as we can bring you back, we will. How we measure that and figure that and understand that is, is tough because we don't know exactly when this furlough would end. I mean, is it something that ends in May? Is it something that ends in June? Does it end in July? Uh, and what does the worker do in the meantime? I mean, they can't just kind of hang on for two, three, four, or five months hoping for the best. They're going to look for other alternatives. They're going to take other jobs if they can. So all of these become questions, and it makes it kind of difficult to get a, a, your hands around when things get back to normal. <clears throat> we know that the trajectories have begun to become more manifest. We know that you've seen peak reached in lots of countries. What we're not seeing quite yet is the completion of the bell curve. We're not seeing the decline. So it's flattened out. We're not getting any more cases in some of these countries. It's gotten better in China, better in South Korea, better in Japan. But we haven't seen the tipping point yet. We haven't started to see the retreat. And that is the signal, really, for a lot of countries uh, as far as getting back to normal. That is more or less what the criteria is going to be in the U.S. And we'll talk a little bit about what the, the proposal is from the Trump administration. Early on, there were lots and lots of conversations within the White House about what the return would be like. And there were some very overly optimistic assessments. We'll be back by Easter. We'll be back in a couple of days, et cetera. Well, that didn't turn out. Then there was conversation about, well, we'll open up some parts of the country before we open others. That was a problem because the sense was that people would tend to migrate from one part of the country to the other. And that would simply spread the virus. And there was a decision at some point that this is all going to be made at the federal level. And then it was pointed out that's not allowed by the Constitution. So now it's going to be a state-by-state -state conversation. And that is going to require a lot more coordination because you don't necessarily want a few states making the change and other states not making the change. You're going to have that same migratory challenge. Fundamentally, we're talking about the trade-off and, and looking at the different curves. And there's very different performance depending on what the emphasis is. If you are fight predominantly interested in the medical side of things, which right now really has been the dominant concern, the more that you impose containment policies, the flatter the curve. We've been hearing about this now for a month. Flatten the curve, flatten the curve. The more containment, the more opportunity there is for the virus to basically play itself out. But there's also an economic recession curve. And anything that you do to enhance the containment policy makes the economic recovery that much harder. So without containment policies, we would probably have escaped the recession altogether. With the containment policies that have been in place, we have increased the possibility of an economic recession if we push the containment package even further, trying to reduce loss of life, you end up extending the recession that gets deeper and lasts longer. So that's the stark reality that everyone is facing. If you favor trying to control COVID-19, you're going to make the economic recession worse. If you try to come out of the economic recession early and try to get back to normal, you could make the COVID-19 infection rate worse. There's no system in place right now to address both of these in a positive way at the same time. What is good for one is what's bad for the other. Some numbers that we are pretty confident in right now, um, kind of a reiteration of what I presented in the past, we're probably looking at about 1.8 million cases worldwide. Most of the data that's coming out now is pretty trustworthy, even that stuff that's coming from China. We were worried about China for a while because China was pretty deliberately uh, obfuscating and covering stuff up. Now there are so many international health agencies in China, active in all these areas, that you don't see 
the the kind of fudging that you did before because the Chinese are really not the ones that are collecting the data anymore. It's now predominantly coming from the health agencies that are there. We're looking at about 116,000 deaths worldwide. That number goes up every day. But a critical piece of information, and this is part of what has made some of this hard to deal with, 96% of the cases have been judged to be minor minor in a relative sense, basically meaning no hospitalization. Um, if you are suffering from the disease, but it is not required being hooked to a respirator and being in a hospital, it's a minor version. With 96% of the people infected experiencing not a lot more complication than having the flu, and about half of those people being asymptomatic, it makes it that much harder to track because people are completely unaware that they have the disease. I was on a call last week and there were several gentlemen on the call that had had COVID-19. And so the question was, well, what was it like? And one guy said, yeah, it was pretty bad. It was like the worst flu I ever had. Then they turned to the next guy and said, I had no idea. He said, I had no clue that I had it at all. Um, I was, working normal days and I was spending time out at my farm and you know, no fatigue, no breathing problems, no fevers, nothing. And I said, well, you know, it's good for you. He says, no, not good for me. I infected everybody I knew. My whole family ended up getting it because I didn't know I had it. Um, I, the only reason I found out that I had it is that one of my other family members had a more serious version of it and was tested and they tested all of us and said, oh, you've had it for weeks. Uh, who knew? The U.S. statistics, 22,000 some odd deaths. That's about 67 per million. Spain is, is still one of the worst cases, 374. 11,000 in serious condition, 3 million tests, about 8,000 tests per million. South Korea is about twice that. Uh, Germany is about twice that, closer to 16 or 20,000 tests per million. We've had 33,000 some recoveries, but the critical thing on the economic side is 16 million at the time I wrote this, now 22 million people out of work. So you've got that trade-off question again. There are states with stay-at-home orders and there are states that don't have stay-at-home orders. And some of those are in the Midwest. Um, you've got the Dakotas, Nebraska, Iowa, much less strict than some of the states on the East Coast and the West Coast that's gonna play out in the reopening. Uh, there'll be some states, probably these, that will open up sooner than others because of the level of infection they're experiencing. If you look at things like construction starts, um, which is kind of an indicator of the overall economy, it wasn't too bad in March. Even as March was closing out, you were dealing with fairly healthy construction sector statistics, and they are still fairly healthy. Commercial construction has still been on a growth pattern, not as robust as it's been, but is, is respectable. Um, institutional manufacturing, even residential, has been holding its own through this. Now, the reaction is beginning to be felt, and you're not probably going to see this kind of, of growth much longer, but the construction sector has been delayed in a sense to its response. This is, the, again, the new construction impact map. Um, basically, the red is more intense stay-at-home orders, and the green is less intense stay-at-home orders. When you look at the impact and longevity on different sectors, the moderate short-term, these are the ones that are going to come back the most quickly, probably education, manufacturing, healthcare, data centers, warehouses. Part of this is because they are going to be deemed essential and will be brought back more quickly than would otherwise be the case, but there are also sectors where enforcing new protocols will be relatively easier. Um, you're going to be able to maintain that social distance in some of these environments better than in others. If you look at things like hotels and offices, moderate impact, it's going to be harder to keep people apart the length of the industry impact will be a little bit longer because these sectors are also hit harder when the decline took place. And then the most impacted longest term impact is probably retail. And 
service retail as well. That's going to be so dependent on what happens with consumer attitude. If the consumers continue to be worried and concerned about what happens next, they're going to be reluctant to jump back into previous habits. If you look at how we've handled remote activity, this is again kind of hard to read, but you're looking at a comparison of the United States to the UK. UK has been a lot less successful in migrating work away from the workplace into the home office. This is a testimony to our own technological abilities that we have been able to handle uh, moving people into that environment, but it has not been universally successful here either. The initial polls, and this will probably change over time, but the initial polls were interesting. At first, everybody was like, yay, this is great. I've been wanting to work at home for years. Within about a week, it was like, oh my God, I can't stand this anymore. Um, I have got to get out of my house. I am tired of my children. I'm tired of my pets. I'm tired of myself. I want to get out. And there's a now a push to say, don't even think about trying to make this permanent for me. I don't want to do this anymore. And certain industries, of course, have always struggled with trying to have people work at home. When you look at how personal expenditures have been affected, um, obviously there's been dramatic drops in the money spent on flying and, re and entertainment and retail and groceries and things like that. We've had a rather dramatic increase in, in medical expenses, um, but even debt payments have been affected. Everyone's kind of transaction behavior has changed. And in order to get back to normal, these ratios, we're going to have to get back to normal as well. There's been a global trade impact. How bad it is, is going to depend on how quickly we come out of this. The U.S. is, as I mentioned last time, not as reliant on exports as some countries. The Germans rely on exports for 55% of their GDP. We rely on it for about 15 to 20%. But that's still out of a $20 trillion GDP, that's two to $4 trillion worth of value that has basically been yanked out of the economy. If we don't get a reasonably quick response, and if we don't start to come back to, to normal in a reasonable length of time, the impact on trade will be fairly significant. We have seen a tremendous increase in unemployment. We talked about that in the beginning. Um, by in the end of March, it was 6 million, it's now 20 million. The St. Louis Fed, um, and I'm sure you've been following this because it's your local Fed, they did a study, as economists love to do, where they just sort of extend all the bad news <laughs> out as far as they can and say, you know, if you don't fix this, we're gonna lose 55 million jobs. It's like, oh, my God, um, 55 million job losses basically crushes the U.S. economy and, and semi-permanently. The real issue is going to be, are they really job losses? If we are looking at them as, as what amounts to a furlough, the expectation is people will come back to work. And there's a lot of states that have a version of what the Germans have with their Kurzarbeit. The Germans have always had, and not always, but for the last 20 years, they have a system that when there's an economic crisis or a company is in trouble, they can take their workforce, make them half time. The government steps in and pays the other half of their salary so that the company does not lose its workforce. There are about 20, 25 states in the US that have a system similar to this where the company can apply for this program they can take their workforce to half-time status, then the workers apply for unemployment and they get a prorated unemployment check. They get a check that is, is kind of a measured against what they're continue to earn from the company. The point is that they're still employed by the company when there's an opportunity to come back. It's not like the company has to go out and find them again. It's just like, okay, you know, Friday was your last day at part-time, Monday you're back to full-time. Service sectors are obviously hit hard. Um, a lot of areas that one would expect. I mean, 
shopping centers are down and clothing stores are down and, you know, day spas have kind of hung in there to a degree. So I guess when we are in crisis, we need spa time. Um, summer camps are way down. So is massage therapy. <laughs> so things that one would expect. Hospitality impact has been severe. Uh, the amount of, of impact on hotels and theme parks and tourist locations, all of those has been severe. And there probably will be a fairly long lag before this comes back. We're going to have to be confident enough to travel again and start enjoying the, the benefits of a tourist economy. Grocery impact. Um, we have seen a fairly stable grocery environment, but we're now beginning to run out of certain foods and certain parts of the country are running into challenges because of the supply chain. It's not that we're not producing the food, the production numbers are still very high, but it's trying to get them to the market and trying to get them through the distribution system. We have a very complicated food distribution system and food has to go through lots of different hands. And with all the social isolation, isolation provisions in place, it has become harder and harder to expedite that movement. So we're a little bit behind some of the other countries in terms of our food distribution. Again, we're not looking to shortage, but it's gonna be challenging in certain areas in terms of getting the full complement in a grocery store. Residential architecture firms are expecting a certain amount of loss to accelerate in April. They held their own, as I mentioned earlier, in March. They're now beginning to see the declines and that would probably accelerate into May if those are not the, the weeks and months that we make a return. We have seen some growth in some areas. Uh, food has become high demand, which is partly why you've got supply chain issues. The healthcare sector has expanded, media, pharma, pretty much everything else has experienced a decline. In some cases, it's been fairly severe. The construction thing is kind of interesting because the other data was not supporting this 40% decline. Where you've really seen the destruction or the deterioration in construction has been in multifamily housing and senior living. Senior living had been a really driving growth factor for construction and it has all but halted. One of the trends over the last several years has been the growth in senior housing and all of a sudden that's being challenged. Um, we're hearing anecdotally that there are lots of people who want out of the senior living situations they're in because they now equate that environment with being vulnerable to COVID-19. So we'll kind of see if that plays out on a more consistent basis when the crisis is over or if this is just kind of an immediate reaction. Um, real estate has been a little bit in decline, but again, only in select sectors. Um, you've not seen much in the way of real estate activity around manufacturing, but it has been booming in warehousing. So it just kind of depends on the subsector. Oil demand has fallen like a rock. Um, part of this was motivated by the oil war, but really most of this has been related to the restrictions on travel. People are not commuting, they're not going on vacations. Um, if anyone has ventured out onto the highways and roads, it's like, oh my, where is everybody? Um, the highway patrols are now mentioning that they are giving out lots and lots of speeding tickets because people are getting on the highway going, wow, there's nobody out here. I can go 120 miles an hour. And so the highway patrol is saying, you know what? Speed limit's still 70 um, and we're gonna pull you over. So you've seen a pretty dramatic decline in oil usage, which will obviously come back at the point that there's more growth. So ending the lockdown recession, what is it going to look like? We didn't really have a clue until really yesterday. And as we expected, there is going to be a phased approach. The, the notion prior to yesterday was a little bit more complicated than the uh, phased progress that's been described by the Trump administration. Trump sort of has it down to three phases, but it's going to be up to the states. Up until 
really yesterday or the day before, there was a lot of conversation about this being a national move, that Trump would make a declaration and everybody would follow that declaration. Well, that's not how it works. The states have control over what they do with their business. And it was pretty clear that constitutionally, the states were going to put their foot down and say, no, this is not a national issue. It's a local issue. So even with the recommendations on the three phases, the 50 states are all going to come up with their own version of this. They'll be close, but they're all going to have some, some differences. The first phase is supposedly kind of normal retail and service operations. It's reopening stores and restaurants and service places like dry cleaners and things like that. It's basically opening up the world back to the consumer. There's some controversy over this and some states are going to take a different approach because opening up a bookstore is different than opening up a restaurant if you're still trying to maintain some kind of social distancing. The next phase, according to the recommendations from the Trump administration, includes more opening up senior centers to more visits, more crowd-oriented activities, more sporting events, more concerts, things of that nature. A lot of states will push back on this because that is where an area becomes more dangerous. When you start allowing bars to open up and and people are attending sporting events and the like, you can no longer really control the social distancing part and the spread of the, of the virus is more likely. The third phase is kind of opening everything up and letting the world kind of return to normal. No one is really given timelines for any of these. Um, the idea is that some states would be able to do it maybe as early as the 1st of May. Others might not be able to make that decision till the end of May or even into June. There are, the criteria for most states seems to be, are we in control of our own outbreaks, number one, and do we have the ability to maintain social isolation when we start to open up these operations? The new protocols going forward haven't really been established, but the conversation has been around things like mandatory health checks. There will be circumstances where your your health will be uh, a factor in whether or not you can participate. <clears throat> this may hit airlines. You may have the TSA adding, taking your temperature to everything else that's done by the time you take your seat on the airplane. Not quite sure yet how that plays out. It's been tried in other countries. Um, you now have the little devices that you can run across somebody's forehead and gives you a temperature very quickly. That may end up becoming more common. There will continue to be efforts at social isolation, minimizing contact. How that plays out, what it looks like, not altogether clear at this stage. Um, so you're probably going to see more attention paid to kind of the, the circumstances. The IMF is expecting a fairly quick recovery. Um, so if you look at the data that's coming in from other organizations from the IMF, from the OECD, World Bank, um, European Union, most are still pretty confident about what the rest of this year and into next year would look like. Um, there is a sense that this may be a declining year globally, that we would have a loss of maybe two and a half, three percent going into negative territory, but by, by 2021, much of that would be recovered. So the difference between the world outlook between January and April, in January, which is the light blue, there was the prediction that we would see growth of 3.3%. By April, we were thinking we were going to be in negative territory by 3%. But by 2021, the rebound is more robust than was expected. So you see coming out of this as a fairly motivating period, and the growth actually jumps back up to around 6%. We'll see. I mean, at least that's the, the notion that the IMF has. 
Asia's real GDP growth forecast kind of fits into the same category. 2020 is considered to be a bad year, pretty much obviously, but everyone is going to see a recovery in 2021. In some cases, a pretty spectacular one. You know, Thailand, big jump. South Korea, big jump. Vietnam. And some of these countries have done interesting things as far as coping with, with COVID-19. The country that has had the most success in keeping the number of cases down, keeping the spread down, and in keeping fatalities down has been Vietnam. But they've done this in a very specific way. Um, Vietnam is an authoritarian government, and the laws were explicit. If you appear in public and you are not wearing a mask, that is a one-year prison sentence. If you leave your home when you have been told not to leave your home, that is a five-year prison sentence in a labor camp. And if you are consistently in violation of the rules in Vietnam, you can be in prison for 25 years or you can actually be shot. So the enforcement of social isolation was quite a bit more intense in Vietnam. Most countries that have struggled with containment have struggled with this trade-off between how much can you force people to stay isolated and how much are you going to have to bend to their desire not to remain isolated. In the United States, we started off with exemptions. You can go to the grocery store, you can go to the drugstore, you can go to the hardware store. I mean, as I drive the neighborhoods on the few times that I've been out to go to the grocery store and the drugstore, I mean, I'm, the vape shops are open for crying out loud. I mean, what? So why would we encourage people to do something that makes them vulnerable to the disease we're trying to stop? That's a little confusing. But we're not in a position to start telling people you can't go there. Yet, in some states, we've gone further than others. Michigan began to demand that the stores like Target and Walmart and the like that were open would not be allowed to sell non-essential items. So if you went into Target and you wanted to buy a game or a toy or a potted plant, that's not allowed. That's not, that's not essential. You're only allowed to buy essential things which then starts the whole conversation of like, who the heck are you to tell me what's essential? I have five kids at home who are about ready to rip each other to shreds. They need a game. Um, so it's awkward in a country like ours. We are dealing with all kinds of different political orientations around the world. There are four world leaders, for example, that have been referred to as the ostrich dictators because they have absolutely ignored everything to do with COVID-19. They have not imposed any restrictions of any kind. And the rate of infection is quite high, except that they are not telling anybody because to mention the rate of infection in those countries gets you a prison sentence. And these include Brazil, Turkmenistan, Belarus and Nicaragua. So if you have any of those four on your vacation planning calendar for later in this year, I would, I would remove them. Um, I know that there's a tremendous interest in visiting Turkmenistan from the people in the St. Louis area, but you're just going to have to set that aside for the time being. If you look at this, we talked about this once before. This is the various estimates as to when we're going to get a reboot. The May reboot is still the dominant theory. That is still the one that most economists are expecting. Don't know exactly when in May. It could be early to mid. It could be late May. But if we do get a May reboot, we are looking at maybe a decline of 1.62% over the course of the year. If we don't get a recovery until summer or fall, we're looking at more of a 5.56% decline. So with the May reboot, we may actually escape a recession for the entire 2020. If we don't get a reboot until summer or fall, we could easily be in a recession period for the bulk of 2020. So a lot of it, of course, depends on timing. Different scenario breakdown is kind of a reiteration of what was on the previous slide. Um, there are 
things that have to happen in order for there to be a quick recovery. The virus needs to be seasonal. The fatality rate needs to stay more like flu than, than some of the others. Basically, it's, it's taking the most optimistic scenario. The global slowdown is kind of in the middle uh, where it basically holds that some of the virus activity is as predicted. Some of it is more serious than we anticipated. And then you have the more depressing global recession where everything that we've been expecting to happen really doesn't happen. The virus reappears at the end of the summer and, and we're sort of left with the same conditions in another six or seven months that we're dealing with now. So obviously life has altered. Um, so there, there are many conspiracy theories out there. I personally think that this is all those idiot bears. Um, I'm, I'm sure that they're the ones that launched this and the pets are all getting their revenge. Um, it's kind of like you've been putting these collars around us for years. Now it's your turn. Um, as I mentioned before, if you want to ask more questions more specifically, please feel free to reach out to me by email or phone. Um, many of you get the DIB from the society already. If you don't, you know, tell Dan to put you on the list or you can call me directly. So there were lots of questions last time, which we didn't get to, and I kind of want to spend a little more time on questions. So we'll quit at this part now and We'll take questions because I have to jump off precisely at the hour because I'm doing another webinar for somebody else. I don't even remember who. Um, I think lighting maintenance contractors. So there we go. Well, thank you, Chris. A lot of great information you shared with us. We really appreciate it. We do have a handful of questions that we will jump right into. Um, how well prepared is the typical American household for the coming shock of lost jobs and income? in light of a decade of debt deadening, continuous job growth, and low unemployment? Well, the short answer is we're not prepared at all. Uh, at the time of the 2008 recession, one of the commentaries was that we did not have much float. So if you lost your job, you were probably about 72 hours away from financial distress. And that was considered one of the great lessons from 2008. And for about five or six years, Americans seemed to take that into consideration and began to reduce their debt. If you remember, we had some of the highest savings rates we had had in decades. You began to see people reduce their exposure to credit card debt and all other kinds of debt. And so by the time you got to about 2017, 2018, people had maybe two weeks or maybe three worth of float that they could go for two or three weeks before they desperately had to find income. We began to lose that discipline right around 2017, 2016. So if you fast forward to 2020, we now have a little more time than we had back in 2008, but now we have about three days worth of float, um, three to four. So if we do not find replacement income within <laughs> literally a weekend or more, we're back in, in distress. Most of us do not have a lot of ready credit. Uh, most of us do not have money in reserve. And obviously the people who are lower paid to begin with are even more vulnerable than others. We just, we enjoyed a decade worth of growth and excitement and we thought it would never go away. And that's also the problem many businesses have had. Corporate debt has been growing very rapidly. National debt, I mean, no one has been particularly prepared, despite the fact that there have been all kinds of Cassandras in the economics profession who keep saying, do something, do something, you have to do something, you are not prepared. And, you know, just like Cassandra, no one paid any attention to us. And so now we're just sitting around saying, yeah, well, we told you so. Thank you. Um, we've seen historic drops and slight recoveries seemingly several times in the stock market over the last few weeks. Why so much the up and down? And yeah, the volatility has come back because the market is still very confused as to what the long-term prognosis is. And so they seize on 
any little movement that would signal a direction one way or the other. So if there's good news as far as development of a vaccine or development of a new cure, or if somebody has now reached a peak and is starting to see decline, or if there's some new government program, all of this excites the market. And then a day later, it's like, oh, well, the vaccine isn't going to be ready for a year. The cure isn't really working. The government's run out of money already, and it's not really having the impact that we thought it would have. They had an agreement on oil, except that it didn't change the per barrel price, so now we're depressed again. And so you get this up and down reacting to each little nuance or change in the news. And then you have the age-old battle between contrarians and others. I mean, there are people that lost a lot of money and desperately want to make some of it back. So as soon as the market goes up even a little bit, they sell quickly in order to recoup. And the contrarians just sit back and say, <laughs> really? This is how we become wealthy, you know? There's a reason that Warren Buffett is the richest man in the world. He just buys up the stocks that everybody else is selling. It was like right now, we know that Berkshire Hathaway is buying up airline stocks. The airlines will come back. You know, they're getting a $22 billion bailout from the government. And when they recover, well, you know, Warren's gonna have a good day. Right. Now, what are your thoughts on investing in the stock market right now? Well, I always have to caution people when economists give advice. I always have to ask two questions. One, how many rich economists do you know? Um, <laughs> and, and two, understand that our profession is one that we're really good at talking ourselves out of things because no matter how good something is, we can look at it and say, yeah, but... <laughs> If this happens, it's all going to fall apart. The most sage advice I think anybody can give when it comes to investment is to determine kind of where you are in an investment cycle. If it's money that you need right away, then obviously you're going to try to cash in on whatever is, is showing the most returns. Right now, it's probably going to be healthcare and transportation. If you're investing for a longer period of time, you take the good old diversification approach and hope that when you actually need the money, you're not turning 65 in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis. You know, so as as was pointed out in 2008, if you have the poor taste to turn 65 in 2008, it, that's your fault. Um, you you should have done that earlier or later. Why do you think that China played with their statistics? Yeah, China played with their statistics because they always do. Um, this is a totalitarian state that's controlled by essentially nine men, and they have always fudged. You know, it has always been difficult to find out exactly what's going on in China. As many of you know, I'm the economist for the National Association for Credit Management. One of the keys for a credit manager is information. You know, in order for them to make a credit decision, they have to know whether a company is in good financial shape or not? Do they pay their bills? Do they, you know, all those things. Getting that information in China is illegal. There were a case not three or four years ago where two Dun and Bradstreet people, I mean, just analysts, just Dun and Bradstreet analysts were asking questions about the credit worthiness of some companies in China, which happened to be connected to the People's Liberation Army. They were both arrested on grounds of espionage and were sentenced to be shot until they were negotiated out of China. So China has always hidden things. It has become harder for them because there are more entities in China. Um, the credit information now is leaking out because companies want credit. And the credit managers in the US and Europe are saying, yeah, I'm sure you do but I'm not gonna give you any if I don't know anything about you. So if you're not willing to share, well, you know, be as cagey as you want. I'm not giving you any credit. And then all of a sudden, bingo, here comes good credit information because the company wants access. So the information comes out, but it comes out despite the efforts of the government to shut it down. Like I said, the data now is mostly being collected by international health organizations and is reliable, but the Chinese are still trying to fudge it if they can. Uh, they want to look better if they can.
No, Brad, thanks. Do you see deflation risks in some industries such as automobiles? I don't think we're going to be looking at deflation risks. Inflation, maybe, um, because all this liquidity that has been dumped into the system has not really been able to percolate yet. The whole idea during a recession is to funnel money into the hands of the consumer, which is what we've done this time. You know, we're shutting in money into just a whole host of, of programs, but the trouble is the consumer can't spend it. Uh, there's too many things closed down. When everything opens up and the consumer resumes behavior, they're likely to really flood the system with activity. The deflation would probably not occur unless you have a real reluctance on the part of the consumer to go back to normal, in which case the business community will be stuck with trying to stimulate consumer demand by ever lower prices and trying to entice them back, back into the market. I don't, in the past, we have not responded that way. We are pretty eager to spend money. Money burns a hole in our pocket under normal circumstances. The mantra of the U.S. consumer has always been, I can't be broke, I still have checks. So as long as, as we're in that mood, I think we'll escape deflation, but risk inflation. All right, Chris, we'll do two more questions. How does the increased spending by the, the Fed affect the long term of the economy? Yeah, the Fed right now is doing what it did in 2008. If you remember back at the beginning of that recession, we had an $800 billion balance sheet at the Fed. By the time we got through with 2008, it was a $7.5 trillion balance sheet. The majority of those bonds were being bought by the Fed in order to funnel money into the economy. A lot of mortgage-backed securities being purchased. They're doing the same thing now. They are pushing as much money as they can into the economy by buying the bonds that they have been authorized to sell from the treasury. So the impact is, is not immediately direct and it is not immediately problematic. It becomes problematic down the road. The Fed will have, again, the challenge of paying that balance sheet down. There'll be kind of a lockdown of the bond market because the Fed will have bought so much of the T bills and kind of blocked out corporate bonds and municipal bonds and others. So it's not a, a suicidal move, but it is certainly one that complicates recovery in the years to come. The Fed was making progress on paying down that balance sheet. That's gone out the window. Um, the balance sheet now is as high as it ever was. Great. All right, we'll make this one our last question. At what point in time do we go from a one to two quarter downturn with a rebound to a prolonged difficult to recover from economic depression? I don't think we're heading for depression, but like I said, it depends on the consumer. If the consumer recovers its confidence level, which I think we will, then we're probably dealing with a real recession in second quarter kind of a partial recession in third quarter, and then a pretty robust recovery by fourth. But again, it depends. I mean, the consumer is gonna hold the key to all of this. I have a lot of confidence in our ability to consume, so I think we're going to escape it. We have certainly pumped enough money into the economy that if the consumer chooses to spend, they will. This is a very odd artificial recession. It's been referred to as the lockdown recession, which means that when the lockdown is lifted, theoretically, the recession ends if we all kind of behave. We've never been through one like this before. The thing that's closest to this is 9-11, where we had a shock to the system that we didn't know what to do with. We were paralyzed for a month or two, and then we kind of returned back to normal behavior, but with residual changes. The biggest issue for the U.S. going forward is what we look like going forward. How do we avoid having this happen again? The next question is going to be, do we have mandatory testing? Are we going to have procedures in place for mandatory quarantines? Is there going to be a mandatory vaccination policy? All of these things to kind of prohibit another version of the COVID-19 attack. 
So I guess that does it for this episode of Chris Keel, Plague Monster. Um, we will come back to this next week, and I swear, I swear, one of these weeks, it's going to be unbridled good news, where it's just like everyone's back to normal. We're all going to meet up at Party Cove in the Lake of the Ozarks and just forget all about COVID-19. Right. All right, Chris. Well, thank you again for sharing all of your thoughts with us today. I'm going to encourage everybody to continue to tech, check out our resource page, as well as some of our additional upcurring, upcoming learning opportunities. We will be sending out CP certificates along with a survey the first part of next week, so please keep an eye out for that. And I hope everybody that has a nice weekend, and I look forward to seeing everybody back here next Friday at noon. Thank you again.